Okay, so this talk is about the relationship between belief and credence. Belief is a propositional attitude we have when we take something to be the case or regard it as true. And I'm basically just going to um, assume there's three belief-like attitudes we can take towards a proposition, belief, withholding, and disbelief. At least the proposition you've considered. Um, but you might know, well, look, maybe I believe both 1 plus 1 equals 2 and that I was born in September, but I'm more confident that 1 plus 1 equals 2 than, than that I was born in September. So this like tripart belief thing might not be the whole story. And for that reason, um, a lot of epistemologists think we need something else. It's often called credence. This is a propositional attitude that represents um, your confidence level or a subjective probability of a proposition, usually given a value on the, on the interval from 0 to 1, where 0 is like maximal confidence, some proposition is false, and 1 is maximal confidence, some proposition is true. And uh, unlike belief, there's in principle sort of an infinite number of credences you can take towards a proposition. So credences are much more fine-grained than the belief picture, which sort of just gives you these three options, belief with um, so for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to kind of assume we have both beliefs and credences and think more about what the relationship between beliefs and credences might be. And at least when it comes to questions about reduction, there's three main views on this question. The first is what I call the credence first view. And on this view, credences are the more fundamental attitude and beliefs reduce to or are a species of credence. And there's different versions of this view. Um, most versions of this view think beliefs credence above some threshold. Uh, some, some people put that threshold at 1. Some people put that threshold between 0.5 and, and 1. Some people think the threshold varies with stakes or context. So there's different versions of this view. But what sort of unites them all is that belief reduces to uh, some formal feature of credence. And um, a second view is dualism. And the dualist view says that belief and credence are equally fundamental, and neither attitude reduces to the other. And the dualist usually has some story, we were actually just talking about this on our way back from lunch, about um, roles that belief might play that credence wouldn't play, and roles that credence might play that belief wouldn't play. Um, so that's a second view. But today I want to focus on a third view. And um, that's what I call the belief first view. And on this view, <coughs> Beliefs are the more fundamental attitude, and credences are a species of beliefs. So when Christensen um, sort of originally talked about this view, he construed it as a view on which credences are beliefs about probabilities. But now belief firsters have sort of expanded this view to include both beliefs about probabilities and beliefs that uh, involve epistemic modals more generally, so like might, probably, definitely, um, those kinds of things. So. Um, just so we can kind of put, uh, have a target in mind, uh, I want to present what I think is like a decently plausible version of this view, and that's what I have on your handout as capital belief first. And so that's this. For S to have a credence of N and P just is, so that means reduces to, uh, S to it just is for S to believe M P, where M is an epistemic modal, and M and N correspond to each other. Right? So for S to have a 0.5 credence of this coin land heads, just is for S to have a belief with the content, the probability that this coin land heads is 0.5. Right? But you could also have um, an imprecise credence, an imprecise high credence that it will rain tomorrow is just the belief it'll probably rain tomorrow. Right? Um, so note, like I said just a second ago, this is a claim about reduction. The claim is that beliefs, or sorry, credence is reduced to beliefs, but it also entails a claim about coextensivity across possible worlds. Every time I have a credence, I have one of these modal beliefs, right? And that's actually the uh, thing I'm going to challenge today, but if that doesn't hold, then the reduction can't hold either. Okay. Um, one thing to note, there's sort of a little bit of a background debate about the semantics of epistemic modals, whether epistemic modals express propositions or express something else. Um, and most people that go in for the belief first view, they just kind of assume what's called descriptivism, which is the view that uh, epistemic modals express propositions. So it's probably raining expresses a proposition. Um, but some people think if they don't express propositions, they express credences. That's called creedal expressivism. Um, that debate's not super important for our purposes, but I thought it might be helpful to flag for those of you who might be interested in sort of background debates about the semantics of epistemic modals. So most belief firsters are descriptivists about epistemic modals. Okay, 
So that was just a quick note. Okay, so why focus on this belief first view? Well, I think there's at least two certain advantages that it has. Um, and the first is that this view provides an answer to Christensen's initial challenge to belief first views. And Christensen asks, look, if credence is just our beliefs about probabilities, what's, what kind of probability, uh, what interpretation of probability is the relevant interpretation for those beliefs? And these belief firsters answer, it's epistemic probability. Um, and no, Christensen actually only considers two possibilities, subjective and frequentist. And I think, uh, I mean, I'm not gonna say epistemic is gonna solve all the problems, but I think it's a much more plausible interpretation of probability than um, credences being beliefs about credences or credences uh, being understood in terms of a frequentist interpretation of probability. So, um, so that's one advantage of this belief first view. A second advantage of this belief first view is that it can explain both precise and imprecise credences. Um, you can have a belief that the probability of P is some precise number, but you can also just think it might be that P, or it's probably that P, or it's definitely that P, and those might correspond to more imprecise credences. So I think those are two advantages of this specification of the view. However, um, another big objection that people have raised to this view is um, involves oversophistication. So the common version of this objection says, look, it seems like children and animals they can have credences, you know, a dog might beg to me rather than Al if I feed him more than Al does. And you might say the dog has a higher credence or is more confident that I'll feed him than that, that Al will feed him. But um, it seems like we shouldn't ascribe the dog the concept of probability, right? Um, so this is kind of the second, besides Christensen's what interpretation of probability, this is kind of the second big objection that I think has been raised to this view. Um, Children and animals have credences, but they don't have the concept of probability. So my objection is different than this, but as I'll hopefully noted, there's a sense in which they're related in that they both kind of say there's something that over-intellectualizes over or uh, over, like there's an over-sophistication worry um, that both of these objections have in common. So I want to basically stay neutral on whether this concept of probability worry is ultimately bad for the belief first view because there's um, debates about whether in order to have beliefs we have to have certain concepts and um, debates about whether children and animals, maybe they do have concepts of probability if we understand them simply enough. So I want to kind of remain neutral on that. But I, I did want to note that because I think there's something in the spirit of that objection that's also related to the worry I'm going to raise for the belief first view today. So basically my goal today is to argue against the belief first view. And I'm going to focus on the one I have on your handout capitalized. But this um, worry I raise is going to be a problem for any what I call content enhancing belief first view. And that's a view that reduces a credence in P to a belief with a content that's more complex than P. So this could be credences or beliefs about probabilities, likelihoods, epistemic modals, dispositions, other modals, other numerical components. Um, as long as you're kind of explaining the fine grained or numerical features of credence, in terms of the content of the attitude, uh, I'm, what I'm going to say today is going to be a problem. And this is almost every belief first view in the literature. So um, it's not just a problem for the specific view that I have here. OK. And <coughs> I'm going to um, make this argument by appealing to graspability. So what's graspability? Well, I'm going to take it to be sort of the minimal ability to comprehend a proposition such that one can form a belief or other propositional attitude with that proposition as its content. Okay, so what this is not, it's not the sense of graspability that people um, are talking about in the understanding literature. So that literature is full of examples like this. Uh, Jane's been smoking for 15 years. The government has an aggressive information cam uh, campaign about smoking. This is actually true in Australia. They like put pictures of uh, cancer on smoke packets, which always makes me a little bit intense. Um, but, <laughs> but because of this uh, campaign, Jane is fully informed of the dangers of smoking, but she is, hasn't been compelled to quit. But then her colleague gets lung cancer. And um, learning about her colleague's condition helps her grasp the dangers of smoking and makes her quit for good. So this sense of graspability is often what people in the understanding literature say distinguishes understanding from just knowing P or believing P. 
But that's not what I'm talking about today. That's a much thicker thing than what I'm talking about today. Today I'm just talking about the minimal ability to sort of comprehend or uh, grasp a proposition in order to form a belief about it. And this ability is probably going to be agent relative. What's graspable for some agents might not be graspable for other agents, depending on um, whether they're a philosopher or not, what their cognitive abilities are, that kind of thing. Um, and Liz, for, can I just interrupt? Yeah. Does your handout have two sides? Yes, it does have two sides. Uh, um, did we only get the first side? Okay. Oh, no, no. I'll, I'll go, I'll go. <laughs> fix this problem. Oops. <laughs> I have one yeah, hand out. I have two sides. Oh, right. I only have Is, I'll go make a copy of this. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I was just like, fuck, argument. And that's, we're done. That's it. We're good. No, the whole. <laughs> Oh, actually, the argument is on the first side. So that's good. So we, I can keep so going for at least a little bit. <laughs> okay. Um, so this sense of graspability is often what comes up if you're looking for like a literature and the literature on epistemic justification and specifically debates about internalism and the kind of internalism's awareness condition, which is if you have justified belief that P, you need to be aware of what justifies that and usually think that's another justified belief. Um, but then you get a regress and then some people, like Mike Bergman, I think, uses this as an argument against internalism because he's like, then to have a justified belief, you would even need to grasp an infinite number of propositions or an infinitely large proposition, and you can't do that, so internalism is false. Um, that, that argument is totally not relevant, whether that succeeds or whether internalism, externalism, that justification is true isn't relevant today. But that is, that's the sense of graspability that I'm interested in for our purposes. Um, okay, so hopefully that's a little bit of helpful background, both on some kind of belief cream stuff and then also graspability and what I mean by it. Okay, so now let's move to section two, which is the argument. So I'm going to start with a story. So Sally's two friends, Erica and Billy, are fighting. Sally's telling her mom about this fight, and she says the following. He said that she said that she knows that he believes that she's mad at him. So her mother is concentrating and listening very carefully, and she barely grasps this proposition. Let's stipulate it's on the very edge of her comprehension. Um, Sally's mom knows that Sally tends to side with Billy on things, and so when she grasps this proposition, she's somewhat skeptical, and thus is only moderately confident that this proposition is true. In other words, Sally's mom forms a moderately high credence that he said that she said that she knows that he believes that she's mad at him. <laughs> um, so this scenario seems possible, but if it's possible, it actually creates a serious problem for any content-enhancing belief first view. And here's why. Sally's mother cannot form a belief in the proposition that embeds the sentence in an epistemic model. The proposition that Sally uttered is just on the edge of her mother's comprehension, and so the more complicated modal proposition is too complex for her to grasp. So she can't form this modal belief that supposedly corresponds to her credence because it's ungraspable for her. So here on, on the handout, um, this is one of those arguments that I think you can actually just kind of put into premise conclusion form and then debate about the premises. So I've done that on the bottom of the first page of your handout, so I'll talk about each premise really quickly. So the first premise says that there's a proposition such that S has a belief attitude towards it. That proposition is graspable for S, but S cannot grasp a proposition that's more complex than that proposition. So I think we can call these edge propositions. They're propositions right on the edge of someone's graspability. And uh, this principle, I think, is pretty plausible. It also finds support in the literature. So Robert Audi says, surely for a finite mind, there'll be some point or other at which the relevant proposition cannot be grasps. grasped. Mike Bergman says, uh, before reaching a proposition that they are unable to grasp, agents considering, considering perpetually more complex propositions will reach one they can barely grasp. And so I think this is kind of what's going on in the case of Sally's mom and in similar cases. And this proposition just says that these, uh, sorry, this premise just says that these propositions are, uh, exist for some possible agents in some possible scenarios, right? Um, so it's, it's not super strong. The first part about the belief attitude, you might wonder what that's doing, but it's needed later in my argument for the conclusion to follow from another premise I have. I don't think it actually makes this premise that much more implausible, 
So I um, decided to leave it like this, but I'm also open to suggestions for if you think there's a better way to kind of formalize this. I'm, I'm very open to that in Q&A. Um, so hopefully you'll see, why, you'll see why I need that in a second. Um, so the second premise says MP, the model, the proposition embedded in the epistemic model is more complex than P, the bare proposition. Um, this just seems true, right? <laughs> An embedded proposition is more complex than a bare proposition. And uh, I've, I've focused on content enhancing belief first views. So these views are pretty explicit that in order to explain what credences are, they add content to, uh, to what complexities added to the content of what's believed. So something's added to the content. Um, and the added complexity of the epistemic model or the probability part, that's what captures the fine-grained or numerical features of the credence, and that's what sets them apart from beliefs. That's what tells you when a belief is a credence. Uh, so I think this premise is just really hard to deny, and most belief firsters basically explicitly accept it by their own lights. Um, okay, so that's premise two. Premise three says that if S cannot grasp something, then S cannot believe that thing. Um, another way to think about it is it's stating a necessary condition for belief, right? If you believe something, you have to comprehend or grasp that thing, right? Robert Audi says, in order to believe P, one must have thought of the relevant proposition P, and P must be able to come to one's mind. So the thought is, if a proposition is too complex for one to grasp, then forming a belief in it is impossible. And note that this doesn't require you to have always had a past or current awareness of the proposition, right? So you might believe that electrons don't wear sneakers, even if you've never explicitly kind of grasped or currently informed that belief in the past. That's consistent with what this premise is saying. All it's saying is that in order to believe P, it must be possible to grasp P. So we don't have to have, there's, we don't have to take, there's no controversial stance on whether a current awareness is required for a belief or not. Um, okay, so that's premise three. Premise four is that if S can have a belief attitude in P, then S can have a credence in P. And I think that we don't really have a reason, especially a reason that doesn't presuppose the belief first view, to think that there are cases where S has a belief attitude towards P but cannot form a credence in P. Um, this, this, so to deny this, you would have to say there's cases where S has some belief attitude towards P, but it's actually impossible for S to form a credence to P. Um, and look, it seems like S can form a credence in P if they have a belief attitude towards P, because S grasps P, grasping P is often sufficient to form a credence, but at the very least, even if it's not always sufficient, having a belief attitude is sufficient um, for the ability to form a credence. So the thought is it's at least possible to have credences and propositions uh, in which we already have belief attitudes. All right, we got handouts with two sides. Yes. <laughs> Sweet, <laughs> that's actually perfect timing. Sorry, okay. Nevin, you missed the explanation of the argument, but hopefully you can read it. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so from those four premises, the first conjunct of my conclusion follows from premises one and three, and the second conjunct follows from premises one and four. And premise five entails the denial of the belief first view. Basically, it's giving cases where we can't believe a modal proposition, but we can have a credence in it. So the idea is that in the case of these edge propositions, we can form credences in them, but we can't form the more complex modal beliefs that are required for the belief first view. And notice that um, on the dualist view and on the credence first view, the two kind of main opponents to the belief first view, they have no trouble at all explaining these cases. Right. Uh, on those views, credences don't reduce to a kind of believing, and the fine-grained uh, aspect of credences is part of the attitude of credences, not part of the content. So that's kind of the crucial part. What makes a credence a point for a credence is a feature of the attitude rather than the content. They're not trying to enhance the content to explain credences, so this is not a problem for dualists or uh, credence firsters. Okay. So now on the back side of your handout, which we now have, woohoo, um, I basically want to consider a couple objections to uh, these premises. So the first premise, I think I have four objections to it. I think that's probably the main one belief firsters are going to try to push back on, but then I have objections to two of the other premises as well. Okay. So premise one basically says there are these propositions that are on the edge of S's 
comprehension, these edge propositions best can have a belief attitude towards them but can't grasp a more complex proposition. Okay, so the first thing you might wonder about, well, what about strategies that people have proposed that make previously ungraspable propositions graspable? So Catherine Elgin has this thing that's called exemplification, and she basically argues that, look, in cases where things are really complex and nuanced, we can use a model or a stand-in to exemplify the main points that enables us to grasp them, even though we couldn't previously grasp them. Um, so maybe yes can grasp a more complex proposition by using one of these strategies. Okay, so I think these um, models and arguments raise interesting questions about the bounds of graspability. They're useful for answering questions about where we should draw the line between the graspable and the ungraspable, right? But for my argument to work, I don't have to take a stand on where the line is between the graspable and the ungraspable. I just need there to be some line, and it could be even agent relative, right? So I think Elgin's strategies don't actually raise a problem for my argument because they're not trying to get rid of the line altogether. They're just saying we've drawn the line in the wrong place. So I did that one first because I think it's a little bit of an easier answer. Okay. Um, here's a second thing you might think. Well, what if we take one of these edge propositions? He said that she said that she knows that he believes that whatever. And let's just call that P. And then we can form a credence because we just believe probably P. So is that a good way to go? And actually, Andrew Moon, who likes this view, he's the one that proposed this to me. He's, he's the one who's the on attacking. So that was Andrew's strategy. OK. So I, I'm worried about this, and, and here's why. Um, if this is actually a legitimate way of grasping a proposition, then I think we can iterate it, right? Um, so we call probably, we have he said that she said that whatever. That's P. We can believe probably P. It's called probably PQ. Uh, then we can believe definitely Q, then call definitely QR. Then we can believe it might be the case that R, then call that S. And we can keep going, keep going, keep going. And I think it's just not plausible that uh, there's no like in principle bound to graspability or that we can at least use the strategy to just grasp more and more and more complex propositions. I think, uh, I, I just think it's not plausible that we're actually truly grasping those propositions. And so I think this suggests that this labeling strategy is not a legitimate way of grasping a proposition. Okay, third, you might wonder, is graspability actually a threshold concept? Um, is that the right way to think about graspability? So I guess first, um, it's consistent with my argument that graspability takes different forms in different contexts. So I don't have to say that there's a sharp cutoff in every single case or that there's always this strict binary. I just need it to be a threshold concept in some cases. And um, to have a counterexample belief first of you, all I need is one case, right? Uh, and further, I think these cases where there is a, a cutoff do seem possible. And it's hard to see why we should sort of rule out the possibility of there at least sometimes being a threshold. I think many of us have had the experience of hearing some proposition that's just on the edge of our comprehension and grasping it. Um, but the experience of hearing a more complex proposition, even a slightly more complex one, that's a proposition that we couldn't grasp, we couldn't understand. So the, case, the cases that I'm relying on seem like coherent and even common phenomena. Someone utters an edge proposition and you form a degree of confidence in it, even though it's right on the cusp of your comprehension. So I don't, I, I don't think it's plausible to say that graspability can never be a threshold concept. Okay, so the third objection, here's the fourth objection to premise one. So maybe MP is more complex than P. But MP is just kind of giving P a certain shading or valence. So if you believe probably P, you're just kind of shading P in a certain way. So every time you can grasp P, you can always grasp MP. Um, okay, so two thoughts on this, this shading thing. Uh, first, presumably we can have precise credences in edge propositions, not just imprecise ones. But I think it's a lot less plausible that a belief like the probability of P is 0.5, or it's definitely probably true that P is impossible. It's, it's a lot less plausible that those are just shading P. Uh, it seems like something more complex is going on there because we kind of stack these modals inside of each other. So I think it's a lot less plausible to think that you can grasp definitely, possibly, probably P in virtue of grasping P. Um, but second, and I think more importantly, um, so it's interesting to think about, well, what does it mean to sort of grasp a proposition with a certain shading or valence. And I suspect that's 
what's actually going on in these cases is that you're not adding something to the content of what's believed, but rather the shading is actually a feature of the attitude and the content of your attitude is just P. So consider believing P versus desiring P, right? They feel sort of phenomenologically different. There's something different about having those attitudes, even though they both have the same content. And the thought is that might also be true for belief in P and credence in P. Uh, it might feel different to have a belief in P and have a credence in P, even if they both have the same content P. And so I actually think um, in these cases, the shading is actually a feature of the attitude, not a feature of, of the content. I think that's actually a more plausible way to think about what's going on here. So the different attitudes are presenting the same proposition, but in different lights. Okay, so there's um, four objections to the first premise. Um, now I wanna think about the third premise, which says that if you can't grasp something, you can't believe it. So here's a worry for that. Um, suppose Daniel says something about super irrigation that's super complicated and none of us understand it. We're like, we have no freaking clue what you're talking about. Um, but Daniel's like super reliable when it comes to super irrigation. He's like really, really reliable. And so we all think, we don't know what he just said, but it's probably true. Um, so we, we're going to believe it. <laughs> so the thought is, in this case, uh, you can believe some proposition even if you don't grasp the proposition. Okay, so what I want to say about this case is that this actually doesn't count as believing P. Um, you're not actually believing the content uttered. You're just kind of saying whatever he just said is true but you don't understand the content uttered. So you can't encode the information and the way that beliefs encode information. This new attitude, whatever it is, isn't gonna play the functional role of belief. It's not gonna represent the world such that P, it's not gonna result in behavioral dispositions that beliefs normally result in, right? So on almost any view of belief and philosophy of mind, you're not gonna count as believing it. So there's something else going on here, but you're not believing P. So that's my response to that. Okay, finally, I'm going to consider an objection to premise four. Um, okay, yeah, 28 minutes, perfect. I'm almost done. So premise four says if you can have a belief attitude in some proposition, you can have a credence in it. Um, and you might wonder, well, look, maybe credence is in some way kind of a more intricate or more complex attitude than belief. So sometimes grasping a proposition is sufficient to form a belief in it, but not form a credence in it. Okay. So I just want to bring out how radical this suggestion is, right? So the suggestion that it's merely possible to have a belief but have not formed a credence in it, that in and of itself is super controversial, and I actually think most people deny that. They think if you have a belief, you just automatically have a credence in it. Um, but this objection, so to deny this premise, it actually requires something even stronger than that. So it requires that there are cases where you believe P, and it's impossible for you to form any credence at all in P. Precise, vague, imprecise, fuzzy, et cetera. So this reply just automatically rules out the cream's first view. Uh, it's inconsistent with that view. And I just don't see what would motivate this extreme of a commitment at all, except for a prior commitment to the belief first view. So I, I don't think that denying premise four is a good way to go. Okay. So <laughs> that's my defense of my argument against some objections. You guys might have more. I'm excited to hear them. Um, I want to note one potential upshot of this argument before we conclude. So the implications of this argument might go beyond the case of just credences. Um, I think this argument could count against other views that reduce mental states to beliefs with complex contents. So here's some examples of those. Uh, some, and I have people that like maybe defend versions of these views cited around their handout, but uh, I, yeah. So some people think emotions are beliefs. So anger that you ate my cookie just is a belief that you wronged me by eating my cookie. Uh, some people think intentions are beliefs, so intending to drink coffee just is a belief that I will drink coffee. Some people think desires are beliefs. Desiring a new car just is a belief that a new car is good. Uh, and some people think disbelief is belief, so disbelieving P just is believing not P. Um, and so, insofar as my arguments are successful against the reduction of credence to belief, they might also count against at least some versions of these reductionist views as well. So when you consider edge propositions, or maybe edge contents, if you don't think these are all propositional attitudes, um, the thought is that you should be able to have an emotion, an intention, a desire, or a disbelief with P as its content, 
in virtue of merely grasping that content. But these views uh, require you to grasp something more complex than that. But I want to hedge that because there's a lot of versions of these reductionist views. I gave really like toy examples of them. Uh, so they, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of details I'm running over. And so I'm not at all claiming that these are problems for all these reductionist views. And I really want to leave basically the details of this uh, extension of the argument to future research. But this is a potential way you could extend the argument I'm presenting today. Okay, so I've argued that any content enhancing belief first view runs into serious trouble in the case of these edge propositions. One can form a credence in these propositions, but you cannot believe um, MP because MP is too complex to grasp. So I concluded that however credences differ from beliefs, they don't differ in adding additional content to the belief proposition. Thanks. Sorry, can you say one more time what believing star is? I just gave you an example. Uh, the idea of there are lots of belief star relations where f belief star relations, but you stand in a belief star relation to a proposition just in case that proposition stands in a certain relation to the things you believe. Example, to believe star, a proposition is for it to be metaphysically necessitated by the things you believe. There's no complexity constraint on belief star, believing star a proposition, and so there are all sorts of there are myriad views out there that are just going to use relations like that. So I, I think they're the, yeah. those are the main sorts of, yeah. there are three main strategies there that really are, are sort of left open by, by the argument that you present. Do you think those would mostly be denying premise one? I guess I'm just trying to figure out, also, do you have a, is there a blank piece of paper I could write notes on? Um, or like the back of one of the handouts? Thank you, that's perfect. Sorry. The, the, I mean, the propositions are complex things. Well, premise one is a false pro presupposition, you know. How com if you think of proposition as a set of worlds, say, it's just... Yeah, good, so yeah. So the, 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 whole, the whole framework, it's a bit like... I do, I do think that, I mean, I, 
gave so, this paper at ANU, and I do think that the set of worlds thing is probably something I'm just going to have to deny. Um, I, or, yes. like, I mean, one way to think about this argument then is say, the belief firsters have to have this very specific view of propositions, uh, well, which is that they're sets I mean, of worlds. The, the, I, I, we could talk later about that. I mean, there are all yeah. these things called people call Booleans in brain science, as it were, that don't, don't particularly go for the set of worlds thing, but they do go yeah. for, the, like, P, the proposition that P and P is the proposition that P. If, if you have thoughts yeah. like that, that's already having to make you, we much more careful, ourselves much more careful than we ordinarily are about talk of complexity. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree there are certain views of propositions that uh, would be ways they could wriggle out. I mean, the main, the main one, at least, that I was thinking of is the sets of world ones. Maybe there's other ones as well. But the Williamson yeah. view would, 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 would deny three, for example. The, is that the non-intellectual guises thing? Yeah. Yeah. Because well, grasp is an intellectual thing. Uh, belief hmm. under an emotional guise or a betting guys or any, under a practical guys doesn't have a grasping requirement. That's yeah, I see. Um, well, I was wondering if believing under a guise... Yeah, I, need, I would like to hear more about what that means, because it... So the thought is, if you believe something under a guise, you don't have to grasp... Yeah, well, that's the... what we say about uh, knowing how to write... I'm, I'm just yeah, saying yeah, there yeah, is yeah, that yeah. big body of literature. I'm not saying it's right, but... You know, right, so right. That. There's certain... Yeah, so, I mean, this came up, too, when I gave it to ANU, is that there is certain uh, views that, that can get out of these things. And, and one, way, one thing to say is just then there's really controversial things that, I guess, belief firsters have to commit to. I mean, I do think with the guys thing... Yeah, I mean, there's also, you might think there's ways to mend the premise such that it's still a problem because belief firsters aren't talking about believing things under a guise. I mean, is the thought like well, credences are beliefs? The for propositions is you believe P just in case uh, for, for some guys in the relevant set, you believe P under that guise. But that's, that, that's a very standard. Okay, so everything's under a guise. It's not just like well, knowing that, how or one, something. That's, that's a very, very standard kind of Thinking about okay. Okay. Yeah, that's. Okay. Sorry. This is this is really this is really helpful though. I mean, these are things I want to think more about, and some of them are a little bit outside of, um, you know, the the literatures I'm engaging with the most. So so I should read these more. So, so thank you. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, Jared. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Liz. So you did yeah. such a nice job at lunch helping me. Why people care about belief. Oh, good. Why someone would be a belief person? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, so one thought is look, uh, so, okay, so we have, the, when it comes, to, you might be more familiar with this. So when people are credence firsters, they push this thing that's called the Bayesian challenge, right? And they're like, why would we have both credences and beliefs? Either one's going to be redundant or one's going to mislead us. And then they give arguments that credences are like more reliable or something. So, uh, you know, either we don't need beliefs or we shouldn't pay attention to them, something like that. And I think some belief firsters might sort of push a similar line when it comes to credences and probability beliefs. So, like, look, most people think we at least sometimes have beliefs about probabilities, but uh, they want, then people want to say, we also have this other thing that's like credences on top of that. Well, why would we have both? Like either one's redundant or one's going to mislead us. And we already think we have probability beliefs. So let's just kind of throw the credences out. So I guess one way to think about it is kind of appealing to, uh, I guess, two considerations. One is kind of a simplicity consideration. So don't uh, multiply mental states beyond necessity. And then two is sort of a functional role consideration. Like whatever functional role credences are playing, um, they would say belief shot probabilities can play those roles. So maybe, you know, we can put those, those could be inputs to decision theory, maybe potentially. Uh, and, and, and if we can use a version of the U to capture both precise and imprecise credences, then they say, look, all we have to posit is beliefs, but we can kind of capture a bunch of different mental states, uh, maybe even comparative competences if you believe P is more likely than Q. Um, so, you know, credences are this extra thing. We should prefer a simpler theory, all is equal. And then probability beliefs seem to kind of be playing the same functional role. So 
<laughs> that, you feel more. Okay, yeah. So maybe one thing to do would be like motivate this this view a little more so people aren't just like, this view is like crazy. But I do think, I mean, this is probably of the three, I believe first credence, first dualism, this is probably the uh, less po- the least popular. <laughs> so that, for what that's worth, <laughs> yeah. We're really feeling it now. Al? Okay. Oh, Al, yeah. Um, you said you were open to suggestions. Uh, yes. Here's yes. Suggestion for streamlining it. Uh, I was just wondering, did you need to talk about the belief attitude? You know, when you told the story about Sally's mum, the story was mm-hmm. just directly, she, she's got this credence, yeah. right? Credence. And we intuit, gee, that story seems possible. You know, there could be an agent who has a credence in this edge proposition. And then just away we go, and then you don't need premise four. Uh, so I wasn't sure if belief attitude was really doing much. What mattered was having. Yeah. Credence, you know, to this maximally complicated proposition, yeah. and then you can't go any more complicated. What's the so point of having right? the belief? Yeah, I, I actually reformulated it recently because I was, yeah, I don't know, I don't know, maybe I, but, but I actually didn't have the belief attitude in there before, um, and part of it was because I did have the premise, if S can grasp P, then S can form a credence in P, and I don't know if... Uh, I was thinking that that is less plausible than the current premise for, because like maybe uh, a prem- like thinking about something makes you so emotional that you just can't even think about it anymore, and even though you grasp it, you just like can't form any mental states towards it or something. I mean, I don't know. Maybe these are like really weird cases that I don't need to worry about. But I was just thinking that I don't know. I mean, I'd be interested if people think that's plausible that grasping a proposition is sufficient for forming a credence in it. But I think that would. At least, at least that's the way I had sort of bypassed the belief thing. And, and, and then the way this is written, you already have an attitude that's actually like, in some ways, a lot like a credence towards it. So why can't you also form a credence? So that's kind of the thought. But, but, but there might also be another way to do it that doesn't, use, that doesn't have either of those. I don't know. Because when you told us the story, you, you yeah. first through a belief attitude that Sally's mom had and yeah. then, then made plausible. That was pre- no, it was just directly to the story. She's got a credence. Yeah. 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 That no. That's that's probably right. So maybe there's there is a way to to simplify it. I guess I was thinking, on this reading of premise four, it's super plausible, and premise one isn't much less plausible. But you're right. I mean, it might be it, a simpler arguments better all else equals. So I, I take the point. I take the point. Yeah. Um. Okay, so uh, you said in the introduction that you, we shouldn't ascribe to a dog the concept of probability, mm-hmm. and I would make the flippant point that my dog understands probability about as well as most people in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a really smart dog? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just probability is difficult. Um, um, but in a yeah. flippant way, um, a dog doesn't need to understand probability in order to behave in a way that would be approximately yeah. the same as if it did understand probability. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, another example of that is is I have a reasonable grasp of, of Newtonian physics and I can catch a ball moderately mm, well. That's a nice... My dog has no grasp of Newtonian physics but catches the ball just as well as I do. Yeah, good. And the act of catching a ball is well described by yeah. Newtonian physics. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, you're basically outlining the beginnings of what the belief firsters basically say in response to the, the, the other oversophistication objections, so not the one, but the, the one that has to do with the concept of probability. And that's uh, that either the children or animals in question actually do have the concept of probability, so that's one possibility, or if not, uh, we can explain their behavior by appealing to like subpersonal mechanisms, and that might be what's what. Like, I would appeal to evolution. I don't, don't know that we need. Oh, to I mean, also, yeah, same difference. I mean, yeah, but but the thought is that uh, in either case, they don't need the concept of probability. We can, well, sorry, either they do have the concept of probability, or they might still behave in ways that. Uh, even this like seem like they're maximizing expected value, but that's explainable by uh, like evolution, uh, subpersonal mechanisms that kind of came from evolution. So, but there are interesting cases like uh, bees and ducks. I think uh, when you give them food, 
and like different, I, I forget the exact experiment, but it was like different um, rows had like different amounts of food coming out and ducks would actually line up in such a way that like maximized the expected value, the chance of them getting food. And like, it would be crazy to say like, oh, they're like doing a decision theory calculation in their head. You know, what seems like is going on is there's some kind of something subpersonal that explains that behavior. Yeah, maybe. Right. And so, um, so yeah, so that's, that's kind of what the belief, I think what the belief firsters will say about that objection is that um, they don't have to have the concept of probability in order to ex uh, behave probabilistically. So yeah, that's a good question. All right, David. Cool. Yeah, so I wanted to, I guess, have an objection to premise one. Okay. With, so I definitely want to acknowledge the thought that are like finite limits to what we can grasp or whatever, but yeah. I'm sort of uh, skeptical from there to the premise one. Mm, so okay. Are two different ways of thinking about our finite bounds, which might make you worry about one. So one is the sort of vagueness thought. So you might think, look, there are bounds mm -hmm. to being a heap. Uh, at one grain of sand isn't a heap. Uh, does it mean that there's an edge number, or the edge number of grains of sand? So that if you make it a bit less, then it's no longer a heap. You might think, uh, no, that's the wrong way of thinking about it. And that seems sort of intuitive in the case of graspability. It seems sort of a vague mm. thing, but it's not entirely clear. It's a binary mm -hmm. note. Yeah. Uh, second sort of model is sort of think of our graspability as sort of an open set. So consider the open set of real numbers from zero to one or something. There's no edge number that uh, uh, you know anything above it isn't in the set, or anything in the set can always go a bit above. That also seems sort of intuitive to me. So it seems like when I fully grasp a proposition, like adding definitely is always like sort of within my principal grasp. But there are sort of different propositions in kind that are just beyond me, like, I don't know, crazy and military conjunctions or something, that aren't of this form where you just add definitely to our probability to it or something. So mm -hmm. those are sort of two different models where there's sort of, you, you have the intuitive thought that there are finite bounds to what we can grasp, but you're sort of iffy about this, whether there exists edge propositions. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Um, yeah, the vagueness thing is interesting. I mean, I'd be interested to hear in, like, what other people think about this, but I guess, what I was thinking about that is that I, I think I do have to commit to there, it, it not being a vague thing that there's at least, in, in some cases, there's kind of like a sharp cutoff from graspability, not graspability. So you might think, yeah, that's kind of a cost of my argument. And I tried to motivate a little bit, like it does seem like there are cases where there's a proposition that you can grasp and then the more complex ones just beyond you. But you, but yeah, but but I do think that that's a that's a totally fair way to push back and I might need to, try to beef that up more, say a little bit more about that. Um, and I, I mean, one thing I did say is like, it could take that form sometimes, but as long as sometimes it doesn't take that form, that's all I need. So that's a little weaker, but but I think you're right. That's that's something they can say. Um, I don't know if I feel, can you say more about the open set? Or I don't know if we have time. Yeah, uh, yeah can you can you repeat that part? Yeah. It's sort of a thought where you can, you can think that for every proposition, uh, there is some more complicated one that you can grasp. Yeah. Uh, but it's still the case that there are bounds to what you can grasp. So if you think of it as sort of an open set, uh, okay. between zero to one, for any real number between zero to one, there's gonna be some slightly bigger one. So there's no sort of edge real number. And I, and I was thinking that's somewhat intuitive in the case of graspability. Yes, every finite composition, every, everything about finite numbers, right? But not yeah. about infinity. Yeah, so something like that. So, oh, I see, so okay. No like edge thing, but there's still I see, okay, because yeah, I was trying to figure out, because I had that thing, like that iterating thing, where if you can like keep iterating, you can make it like, you know, there's no bound to how finitely complex it could be. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so, I mean, I still think there's probably finite propositions yeah. that we can't grasp with that are too complex. But there might be other ways of developing it that don't rely on the finite infinite distinction that I would need to yeah. think more about. But I definitely, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that there's some propositions that are finite that we can't grasp. Yeah, so, it has to be that, yeah. like, the finite propositions of the form, definitely, probably, definitely, probably. Uh, some finite, yeah. Yeah. Finite seven models and then something is always within our grasp. Right, and, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm skeptical of that. Like, yeah, yeah. but but yeah, if if you could get that view off the ground, that would that would be a way to resist premise one also. So yeah. Got Brian and Zach on Um, great. Um, well, for first thing, I, I actually think I like the open sets kind of issue. I, I think yeah. there might be a response to the vagueness issue because uh, I was worried okay. about that as well. Yeah. I was thinking that maybe maybe it's enough for you if you say even if it's indeterminate which edge proposition there it is because 
uh, you know, uh, graspability is a, a, you know, obey some kind of quasi-tolerance principle or something, you can still say, uh, just tackle it determinately, right? Uh, so determinately oh. within some edge proposition such as blah, even if it's indeterminate, which it is, and then, uh, and then you know, with suitable modifications, I think you, I think you could get, for conclusion five, um, uh, therefore, you know, it's determinately the case that there is a P such that S cannot believe M P, but can't have a credence in P. And that might be enough to like um, rebut the belief first view. Um, I, yeah. my, my question though was, um, that seems I, right. I, I think there's more to be said, or I didn't think premise, denying premise four is quite as bad as you suggest. Really? Okay, <laughs> I'm like not. <laughs> yeah, it's true that um, I, it, you know, credence first people won't like it, but that's okay. I mean, you know, yeah. trying to defend belief first. And I don't think I don't think it's quite true to say uh, <laughs> that. Um, I think you said like it, it's hard to see what could motivate it behind the prior commitment to the belief first view. I was thinking like I could at least imagine a kind of dualist view that would uh, um, mm. uh, endorse a kind of rejection of premise four. If you, if you, I'm thinking of like someone who just thinks like belief and credence are doing different things. Uh, you know, maybe maybe belief is what's going on with like conscious reasoning, and uh, credence is what's going on with subconscious reasoning, and then just yeah. take a case where kind of like you could only engage in conscious reasoning or something like that. So that's a dualist picture where there'd be some condition where it's only possible to have um, a one of the belief attitudes, but not a credence attitude. Um, now I, don't, I mean I'm not like endorsing that view of belief. Yeah. Like, far too crude, I would think, but. I mean, I was just thinking, you know, a dualist who thinks not just that they're equally yeah. fundamental and neither reduces to the other, uh, but, but who also thinks that they can come apart and yeah. that they're really doing very different things. Um, uh, yeah. For that. So it's he, true that uh, it seems like you have to re reject credence first, but maybe that's not such a, such a big cost. Yeah. I mean, by analogy, someone might say, um, I mean, for different reasons, not because they have this, um, what do you call it, like the kind of... Um, complex attitude sort of issue, but like take someone, take a preference and utility. So someone who, um, it, you know, plausibly you would think that it is possible to have a sort of um, a cognitive or, or desire-like attitude uh, to P without having a utility for P. Um, for instance, if your uh, preferences don't satisfy the relevant axioms, uh, so mm. you're represented with utilities. Now it's true that, um, so, I mean, that's, that's for, you'd reject, uh, so that would reject an analog of premise four, but for um, different reasons. Right. Uh, but, but, you know, it's true that that, that, that story would, re would uh, require uh, rejecting all, like, utility first views, but dialectically, I think that'd be kind of okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm just writing a few things down. Yeah. No, that's helpful. Um, yeah, so... I, I, okay, I, I want to concede a lot of what you're saying because I do think there's at least possible dualist views that uh, on which it's, it, you know, you have a belief and it's impossible to have a credence, right? Though it's true that there's possible dualist views that say that. And I think I probably shouldn't say there's no reason that doesn't presuppose the belief first view to accept this. So I concede that. But I think in terms of the actual dualist views out there and what dualists actually want to say, um, I mean... So it's one thing to say, so belief and credence like play these different roles or whatever, maybe they're like operating even in different domains or something. Um, but to say like, and that might even motivate the idea that sometimes we have beliefs in P without credences in P, like that we could have a belief in P without a credence in P. But this requires saying there's cases where you have a belief in P and it's actually like impossible for you to form a credence in P. Like you can't form a credence in P at all. And and, and, and I think even that first thing, I mean, at least like, like referees, like they'll just like presuppose belief entails credence. Like if you have a belief in P, you have a credence in P. And so, so this is like two steps away from that, right? It's not only saying, are there cases where you have a belief in P and you don't have a credence in P, but it's saying there's cases where you have a belief in P and it's, you cannot form a credence in P like no matter what. So, uh, so, so, so like, I, again, I concede that like there is maybe a dualist view on which this could be true. I just think, yeah, like almost all dualists aren't gonna want to say that because that's really strong. But, 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 but fair points. I mean, that that's helpful. It's so, also yeah. just real quick. It's yeah. worth noting that like credence really is, I, I think, like kind of like philosopher's jargon. So I'm not sure how yeah. seriously absent some theoretical picture we should take just the, the sort of brute like sort of view. Then of course, like you know, 
Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, no, that's fair. I, so I actually like to think about credence as a lot like confidence levels mm -hmm. and just to think like, I mean, yeah, there's different people working on credences have like different goals and different purposes for their research. But I actually like to think I'm talking about things that like people actually have. Uh, maybe they're often not super precise. I think they are probably sometimes when we're, you know, proportioning our credence to some statistic or there's like a coin flip or a dice or whatever. But I, I like, but I want to think like, no, we're like talking about a real thing. They're kind of like confidence levels, maybe precisified or formalized in certain ways. But, um, but Andrew Moon actually has a paper, uh, belief without confidence. So he's like, hey, sometimes we believe things we don't have a confidence level in them. But even he doesn't say this even more extreme thing, which is sometimes we believe things and it's impossible to have a confidence level in them. So, but yeah, I do, but yeah, that's, that's, it's helpful to, to maybe say that in general is I, I do like to think about credences as something we actually have similar to our everyday notion of confidence, so. Excellent. So we have a fair bit of time left. So if you have a second question, be thinking. Uh, Zach, you're up. Cool. So I guess I have to jump in and follow up on this, this David and Brian uh, thing. Yeah. So, um, and I think this might be helpful to you in the end, but I'm not exactly okay. sure. Okay, so, that's, that's cool. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I take the point that like, I, th I think it's kind of implausible that um, when we think about an edge case, mm -hmm. it's like there's a proposition that I fully grasp and then we just negate it, and then suddenly I don't grasp it at all. Mm. Um, and, and I can feel the appeal of thinking, okay, maybe that's not, maybe that's not quite right. And so maybe what we want to do um, is have a graded, a graded notion of graspability, um, mm. where like you, you might not, we wouldn't want to like say on, and then we add a negation, and then off. Yeah. Um, and so so, um, and if you have a graded, so then there's a question of what happens if we if we have a graded notion of graspability. Mm -hmm. And then there's going to be this question of, um, you'll, it might be a situation where um, the belief that is supposed to be at the foundation is something we grasp less well than um, the proposition that we have a credence in. Mm. Or the, the reverse, maybe. Or the thing you have a credence in is simpler, so we grasp it more easily. Oh. And then the belief that we're reducing the credence to Oh, right, right. Yes, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, cool. And maybe, and maybe there's something unstable about trying to reduce something when, when you grasp it less well. I'm not, I'm not, that's yeah, not that's not interesting. Sure, but yeah, that's interesting. Something, something, something to think about. Yeah, and I think, like, if you really wanted to push this idea that graspability comes in degrees, I mean, I could still, I think the conclusion I would push would have to be a little weaker, but I could focus on cases where there's an edge proposition and we have like a precise credence in it or we embed it in multiple epistemic modals and then you're kind of like, you know, we have this spectrum of graspability and you're like moving, like as you make the credence either more precise or, you know, put more modals in there, you're moving from graspable to ungraspable. And so then um, the premise, I guess, would be like, there's, uh, they would have to say like, there's things we believe that we can only have certain kinds of credences in, like maybe these like very simple imprecise credences or something, but you can't ever have like a precise credence or you can't ever have it embedded in more than one epistemic modal. So, um, and yeah, I mean, like I, I think I said this in the talk, I do think it's plausible that there are cases of edge propositions where we do have precise credences in them sometimes, you know? Um, so that, that would be like a, a weaker way that I think I could still push at least something like the argument, but while acknowledging like graspability is not an on off thing. So yeah, maybe I should add that as a response as well. Let's say like, even if it's not an on off thing, there's at least something I can say. Uh, and there's also Brian's determinately thing. So, um, so hopefully there's at least some options there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, this may be more of a, a, more of a request for clarification. Yeah. Sure. But, but in premise one under is graspability a threshold concept? And, and you state that you merely need to be a threshold concept in some cases. Yeah. But don't those some cases have to be for edge propositions for your argument to work between edge and, and more complex ones? Uh, yes, right. But I think that, I mean. And it's not clear to me that it's necessarily obvious that it would be on a threshold yeah. right at the edge. Well, sorry, so I guess I was thinking that um, if there's a threshold in certain cases, there just would be an edge proposition, right? Because it would be the proposition right before that threshold is crossed. Do you get what I'm saying? So by having a threshold at all, that means there is an edge proposition. Oh, 
see. Do you get what I mean? So yeah. Special implies an edge. Yeah, right. Sorry. Yeah, I, I sort of adopted that term edge proposition after uh, I gave this paper at ANU, and I probably should like define that more clearly, and it wasn't even on the handout. Okay. So, so sorry, that was probably unclear. But yeah, the idea is that an edge proposition is just the one that's the most complex you can gra grasp, such that a slightly more complex proposition is ungraspable for you. So, but that's that that's helpful clarification. I probably should have been more clear. So, thanks. Any other questions? Well, just yeah, I would recommend against formulating this argument with definitely operators. Not my, my okay. I mean, I think cool. Yeah. If you start saying sharp cutoffs, you were very careful. Let's let's ask ourselves: Is there a sharp cutoff between bald and non -bald? Anyone who's not messing with logic is going to say there is a number such that that's bald and that plus one isn't bald. Everyone says that. Everyone, every supervaluationist says that. The, what they don't say is there's some number such that definitely that's bald and definitely that plus one isn't. Then if you start putting definitely, you get you're saying something very tendentious. If you leave out the definitely, you're at least saying something that all the supervaluationists and all the epicenters, but not just the epicenters, all the classical people will say. So if you're, you're going to have to basically deny classical logic to. Oh, to, yeah. And so I don't want to, that. To, but, but it's good. So yeah. you should just be saying there's some proposition such that, uh, you know, uh, uh, he's, it's graspable and. The concatenation of it and probably is, and <coughs> say, that's not tendentious in the in the in the vagueness. Mm, yeah. that's, that's super helpful. That's not okay. tendentious as the some number such that it's bald and it plus one is, yeah. and that's what everyone. Says. Yeah, so that's, that's, yeah, that's a good point. You don't really need my definition. I was trying to actually have it with the with the scope where it is untendentious, like determine like definitely yes, or determine. But, but you sort of say what it means. Need, that yeah, you, you don't need, need any definitely. The crucial thing is that you're not committed to. There being some, some number proposition, such which is, yeah, 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 or there being some proposition. But, but it's not like she needs to throw a yeah, definitely yeah, 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 yeah. 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 yeah, no, that's that's super helpful. Yeah. I I take that on board. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, in that case, I had a question. Oh yeah. So I'll uh, move my chair. Please. I was wondering about the notion of grass stability and what it was relative to. So you mentioned it might be relative to an agent. We're talking about mm -hmm. bounded rationality. Different agents might have different abilities. But then some of the examples that you gave suggested that if the agent had all the time they needed, they'd be able to, to grasp, uh, there wouldn't be edges of the sort that you had in mind. So for example, mm -hmm. if I could just write out, he said that she said that, you know, um, just like, you know, crunch the numbers like I was do, doing a semantics textbook or something. You know, you just sort of keep applying functions. Uh, mm -hmm. Then eventually I could figure it out. Um, similarly, if I had a bunch of time, even if there were Many, many, many conjunctions of unrelated propositions. I could, I could crunch them out if I just had enough time. But um, if you if you say it's graspable for Daniel in ten minutes, mm. you know, precisely ten minutes or something, yeah. then it, it seems to be possible that maybe there is something where, like, at exactly ten minutes, I get to like p. <laughs> but probably p would be like ten minutes plus plus a second. Um, ten minutes so plus I, a second. Yeah, yeah. So so assuming that it takes a little bit more time yeah. to add the modal operator. So I was just wondering uh, if you had in mind uh, not just relativity to an agent given whatever amount of time they needed and paper and pens and stuff, but uh, <laughs> some like, more yeah. constrained notion of what it's relative to. Yeah, good. I guess like two thoughts. I mean, the first thought, and someone also said this earlier this week too, is that I could just make it uh, – I could just time index everything, right? And then that actually – then some of the objections would – not apply either like, oh, what about these strategies to make exemplification, to make it, you know, so I could just say at T, uh, S has a belief attitude toward this barely graspable edge proposition, but S can't form a credence to it because S can't have the modal belief, so, you know, and just time index everything, and I think that would be a way to get out of this because then it's, you're not, you know, utilizing time to make uh, new propositions that weren't graspable for you, graspable. Because the thought is you don't have to do that in order to form a credence, right? You can just, uh, it, just so just make it all at, at the same time, right? But um, it's not just graspable for me at T, but like graspable for me in a certain amount of time, I was thinking. Hmm, yeah. So that's, like graspable for Liz. So maybe, yeah. you say it's graspable for Liz at T, meaning give Liz as much time as she wants 
given her cognitive resources at, that she has at a T, you know, um, uh, that it's not obvious to me that uh, P might be graspable, but probably P wouldn't be graspable. But surely there's some proposition that takes you 10 minutes to wrap your head around. Yeah, sure. I that's, I mean, yeah, so that's another way I could go too, is like just limit the amount of, of time that the agents get. I mean, I, I, I think these modifications are important and things I should maybe think more about and eventually, yeah, incorporate. But yeah, I think there's way, like, as long as there's these propositions that like at a certain time you can believe a proposition, but you can't form the modal belief, then that's all I need to get the problem for the credence first view. But yeah, so, so that might be, yeah, like putting a time limit on it might be a way to go. I guess I'll also say like I'm not 100% convinced that given the amount of time you could grasp any proposition. Uh, maybe, I mean, any finite one? Maybe? I don't know, but... <laughs> yeah. If you have enough time to grasp he said, she said, dot, 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 then if I had like 10 more seconds, I think I could grasp probably he said, she said, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Girl, dog. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, it depends on how many dots there are. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's not helpful, though. Yeah. But we have that's, a few more minutes. Uh, Um, just looking at the upshots and conclusions, the yeah. disbelief is a belief. Yeah. Um, for the non-specialist, what is what exactly would be an objection raised to disbelieving P just is belief that not P? If something like your I, that for me looks reasonable, so if something like your yeah. argument worked against that, I'd be more skeptical about your argument. Ah. Uh. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, most I think most epistemologists think this. They think. There's not like a proposition that you either believe, withhold on, or disbelieve. They just think there's a proposition that you believe or withhold on, and then if you move here, you just believe a different proposition, right. namely not P. Right. Yeah, so I wanted to be pretty tentative with this, and I'm not really fully endorsing it. Also, I mean, I think negations are much weirder than epistemic modals, right? So with negations, to figure out what proposition it is, you can just like figure out whether there's an even or odd number at the front, right? And then you can just... <laughs> so they kind of collapse in a way that like definitely probably yeah, might be... Yeah, right, exactly. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I... So yeah, I wanted to... I mean, this would probably be only the case if you're like really convinced there's some like really sharp cutoff and... Um, yeah, so, so, so I'm not really endorsing this. I was just kind of saying, this might be a, a thing you could try to develop if you were interested in it. Um, but I do think it's actually kind of interesting that when, it, like, when we think about credences, we have high credences, middle credences, low credences. They're all towards the same proposition. But when we think about beliefs, there's believing P and withholding, and those are both towards P. But then once we go down here, the content changes. And that's kind of... I mean, I don't know, maybe that's just how it is, but it's kind of an interesting asymmetry between credence and belief. And, and my friend who I cited on the handout is like working on an argument to try to basically push that disbelief is like a distinct attitude you can take. Um, because the thought is if you don't believe P and you don't withhold on P, uh, you, and you, so if you believe not P, like what attitude do you have towards just P? Um, so he kind of wants to push that there's a distinct attitude there. I don't really have a dog in this fight, so I, I don't want to say it's definitely a distinct attitude, but it was just kind of a, a tentative okay. suggestion. So, but yeah, I mean, but, but I affirm your intuition because most epistemologists do think disbelief is just believing not people. Sure. That's, that's like by far the orthodox view, so. Follow up from some, just one small thought. Yeah. So Ramsey had this little joke about a language where you write negation by flipping the symbol upside down. Uh, like thought like the graspability involved like how long a you know sentence is in the language of thought and the language of thought was that kind of language then you know it'd be just as easy yeah to, <laughs> to grasp P and grasp not P. it's just whether it's upside down in your belief box you know? that's 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 cool yeah you stand in your bed when you think about it yeah <laughs> <laughs> well yeah. all the MSP is all the MSP <laughs> <laughs> Luke's worry that your okay. argument proves too much. You, know, like mm. you do have a dog in this fight now, and you I see. don't want to, because it, it seems like a very plausible analysis of disbelieving, but you just run your argument again and, and yeah, down, so. I see, yeah. Um, I mean, you might think that negation 
behaves differently than epistemic modals do. So I might have to... Yeah, yeah. No, that's, I mean, that's interesting. Yeah, so I might have to commit... I mean... It makes David's picture with the kind of open set kind of picture sort of look kind of plausible. Like, you can always tack on a negation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, but just on that, the, I mean, the way the open set, so here's, the, here's the, the bound of the open set, and so if you're inside, there's always a finite distance between you and the bound, but then if the adding complexity thing is a set of non-infinitesimal size, you can only get close enough to go over them. But then you can say, no, because do finite numbers. Yeah, finite yeah. numbers to infinity. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah but I can't, I mean, the point is, Um, there's no, you can't zero, right? I mean, surely there's there's a finite the, the, this this extra thing that you do isn't isn't malleable of malleable size every time you do it. It's extra whatever it is. You might think how much not adds to the, adds to the complexity of not not is less than how much not adds to the complexity of big. And yeah. so it, it's it's incremental complexity. <laughs> it's also yeah. Yeah. You don't need the open interval zero one. You just do that. Turn over a second. <laughs> Yeah, I was I was originally going to ask about this. Uh, yeah, I think this might be one way, one reason to go. Uh, is one thing that tells in favor of formulating the argument as Al was suggesting. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Because one thing you could like, I, I think you actually can reject um, the argument for the dis in, in the disbelief case. Mm, okay. Um, what you? I'm not exactly sure how it would work with how things are formulated here, but I think you'd be happy with saying that. Yeah, maybe if, if P is really at the very edge, maybe it's possible to believe P, but it's it's just not possible to believe the negation of P, and therefore it's not possible to disbelieve P. Mm. And I think it's the, the fact, it's this thought that if you can take a belief attitude towards, toward it, then you can take any belief attitude toward it. And oh yeah, interesting. It seems like you don't have to agree with that. Now maybe you like it because it, then you, you can say, if you believe it, if you can believe it, then you can take a credence to it. Mm, to yeah, degree. yeah. But what if? But I think it's just going in a sort of simple, a simple case. It's like, here's a proposition. It's really complicated. We'll just stipulate it's simple enough for the person to take a credence mm. toward it, and we'll also just stipulate that anything more complex is not something they could take a belief toward. Um, I think that that might be a way of going. And then, then you yeah. can be committed to this kind of radical. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I mean, I do think I am kind of worried, like, the more I started looking at how many different views reduce things to beliefs, and then I was like, dude, someone's going to just start tones at me, like, I need to be careful. So, so, so yeah, no, that's, I, I take that, that's helpful. Um, I was just wondering if this would um, mean that there would be a problem, but that, or if, if this would mean that those would be committed to saying that you could have a credence of zero in P, but not disbelieve P for some P. I already think that anyway. <laughs> um, I, yeah, yeah, I have some crazy views on the belief in credence and dependence stuff. Um, <laughs> of course you can have credence zero and not disbelieve it. Yeah. The infinite cases, right? Yeah, exactly. 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 Oh. So take a case where that's not going on then. But it's just one of these really hard to grasp. Before anyone starts cheating too hard, I'm afraid. With apologies to Mike and his very clever dog. Uh, uh, <laughs> Thank you.